The audio you're about to hear was recorded in Anchor. Learn more at anchor.fm. From sciencesortof.com, you're listening to Science Sort Of. Hello and welcome to Science Sort of episode 266. Our theme this week is Anchors Away Part 1. I'm your host, Ryan, and joining me to talk about things that are science, things that are sort of science, and things they wish they were science is just me. But sort of a different iteration of me, because for the month of March this year, I was involved with this startup called Anchor that was trying to make a new style of sort of democratized audio. Uh, You may have even seen me promoting my involvement if you follow me on Twitter. And what they were looking for were these short, no longer than five minutes segments produced a few times a day. And I was pretty excited to give it a shot. If you listen to this show often, you know I'm a pretty talkative guy. But it took me a surprisingly long time and more effort than I thought it would to kind of find my voice when it's just me alone with a microphone. And after deciding on a station name, which was Organized Curiosity, and getting a very slick logo design, which is the album art for this episode, so you can see it in the show notes for this episode on scienceorb.com, I came up with some recurring segments and was ready to start producing content. Now, one of the features of Anchor is that the content goes away after 24 hours. But the cool thing is I owned all the content I was producing, so I figured I'd at least be able to share some of the segments I'd been making in a batch or two here on the podcast. While my station is still technically there on Anchor, I've been busy enough that I haven't really been able to produce new content there for a bit, and maybe I'll get back to it because as you're about to hear, I think I was able to make something that was distinct from Science Sort of, but still captures my passion for science outreach. And I would encourage you to check out their website, which is anchor.fm, and their app, which is available on the App Store. There are a lot of cool stations, a few of which you'll hear about in my own segments. And you can even use the app to make your own station and talk about whatever it is you're super into. And they even have a function now to turn that into your own podcast. If you end up doing that, make sure to tweet it at me or to at science sort of on Twitter so we can keep track of what the Paleo Posse are doing out there in the world. So anyways, for this episode, I've strung together a bunch of my segments, beginning with the introduction to my station, which explains the name and the intention behind what I was trying to do, followed by some of the demo content I did for the anchor people that never actually made it to the public feed, and then the segments that were released daily throughout March in chronological order. The app has this feature called Echoes, where another station can mirror one of your segments for the day, and other stations can call into your station, and you can choose whether to post that audio or not. So that's what I'm talking about when those things come up. And I've even included a few of those call-ins, so you're not only hearing my voice this entire time. I've dropped in a little music between each segment to give you an audio marker in between bits, and I'll pop back up at the end for a quick Paleo Pals segment. And of course, the one last thing we need to touch on is the what are you drinking? So as you're about to hear, I had a segment in my anchor station called BioBios, where I featured a biological organism. And uh, one of those was a type of Ray. And so I thought the perfect beer to have would be one of the leftovers from a 4th of July party I went to, which is the Ballast Point Brewing Company Manta Ray, Double India Pale Ale. Big fan of Manta Ray. Other folks have had it on the show before, but I've never had it on the show before. And uh, they always have cool sea critters as their labels and naming convention And uh, Sculpin IPA is one of my favorite IPAs. So as soon as I saw that they had a double IPA out called Manta Ray, I I knew I had to jump on it. And it's delightful. I'm really enjoying it. It will be a good beer to drink when I start cooking dinner as soon as I'm done recording this. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt. I'm a paleontologist, a general science enthusiast, and I am so excited to nerd out with y'all here on Anchor. I have always been fascinated by the natural world. Everything from stars and planets, chemicals and minerals, plants and animals, all that and literally everything in between. Becoming a working scientist means I've had to specialize in one very specific branch of research. For me, that's studying the present and past ecology of animals like sloths, to see how what they're doing today compares with what they or their extinct relatives were doing in the deep past. I do this using tools like stable isotope analysis and dental microwear texture analysis. Now, if those mean nothing to you, but you're curious all the same, then keep listening to this station because I'm going to get to all of it in due time. Because that's what this station is all about, taking little snippets of what we know about the universe, getting excited about them, and then sharing them with you. 
So let's talk about what I mean by organized curiosity. The title of my station is a reference to a quote from Zora Neale Hurston's autobiography. Hurston was an African-American novelist, short story writer, folklorist, and anthropologist. In her autobiography entitled Dust Tracks on a Road, she explains why she struggled to do well in anthropology classes in college. The full quote reads, Research is formalized curiosity. It is poking and prying with a purpose. It is seeking that he who wishes may know the cosmic secrets of the world and they that dwell therein. The next time someone claims to you that scientists are know-it-alls who lack a sense of poetry, I defy them to get through that quote without being moved. Versions of this quote have been used since to articulate both the insatiable desire to learn more and the codified consistent methodology required to learn it properly. Hence, organized curiosity. What can you expect from this station? I'm going to try my best to describe every root word used in science, every organism that has ever evolved on planet Earth, answer every question y'all ask, and then still try to keep you up to date with a bit of science news too. One last thing. In my opening, I talk about cataloging everything we know about the natural world. The we there is purposeful because science belongs to all of us. It is a human endeavor. I would argue the most beneficial human endeavor ever attempted by our species. Is it perfect? Certainly not. And I'll criticize things as needed. But it's ours. It's complicated. It's elegant. And it's my preferred path of finding truth in the universe. The segments I'll be posting to Anchor are things I'm already passionate about in my everyday life. I'm so excited for the opportunity to share my excitement with you. And also tempering that excitement with some organization. I'm less good at that, but I'm ready to give it a shot. I'm also pretty silly. I'm going to try and make jokes. I can't promise they'll be of any quality. I'm just going to make them whenever I see an opening. Philosophizing aside, this is all supposed to be fun, right? With that, thanks for checking out my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have ideas you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, you are always welcome to submit it to my station. Always remember to stay curious out there. There is a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and this time we're introducing a new segment, Better Know a Root. I find that folks are sometimes intimidated by the complicated jargon we scientists tend to use, but most of the time, knowing what those words mean is just a matter of knowing what each part or root of the word means. So in Better Know a Root, we take a root word, define it, and give you some handy examples so you can use it yourself with confidence. Today's root is astro, and no, I don't mean George Jetson's dog. Astro is a prefix from Greek meaning star. It's also sometimes used as aster with an er instead of an ro. For certain nations like the U.S., our men and women that travel into space are astronauts or star voyagers. If you try to predict what will happen to those astronauts based on the arrangement of stars, that would be astrology. If I wanted to add a footnote to that previous sentence saying astrology doesn't work, I could use a star-shaped symbol called an asterisk. Someone who actually studies the stars is an astronomer. If you study the physics of how space works, you would call yourself an astrophysicist. If in my role as an astronomer, I were to use a telescope and observe a rock in space, I would call that rock an asteroid. If that rock then hit Earth, that might be considered a disaster, which is probably my favorite of this list because it's sort of out of left field. But yes, when something terrible happens, we refer to it as a bad star, dis being the Latin prefix for bad. This brings us full circle back to astrology because disaster originally referred to the alignment of stars and planets spelling out a bad fate. So when Shakespeare describes his titular lovers in Romeo and Juliet as star-crossed, he was just calling it a disaster in plain English. Fortunately, I don't believe the stars are out to get you, unless you go outside without using sunscreen, of course. But now the next time you see astro or aster in a word, you'll have a much better sense of what it means. Well, that's it for this installment of Better Know a Root. Thanks for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have your own root you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, you can submit it to the station or tell me about it on Twitter at Haupt. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. 
I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for news you probably cannot use. New science is coming out every day. Is it directly applicable to your life? Probably not. Is it still interesting? Probably yes. A pretty exciting study has come out from a research team in China just published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. That's our National Academy, not theirs. And yes, the acronym is PNAS, but we usually just say it as PNAS. The study is titled Spontaneous Expression of Mirror Self-Recognition in Monkeys After Learning Precise Visual Proprioceptive Association for Mirror Images. That is a mouthful, but here's what it means and here's why it's cool. For cognitive scientists, aka folks who research how thinking works, which is already meta, there's a test called Mirror Self-Recognition Test, or MSR, also sometimes called the Red Dot Test or the Mark Test. It's a test for self-awareness, literally the concept that you recognize yourself as an individual distinct from others, which sounds super basic if you're a human and have been doing it since you started forming memories, but it's actually kind of a big deal from a cognition standpoint. We know that we're self-aware and we can easily communicate that to others because we have language, but testing that in animals is a bit trickier. So researchers have developed this seemingly simple test. Put an odorless, tasteless mark on an animal's body in a place they can't see unless they look in a mirror. Put the animal in front of a mirror and see if the animal realizes that they have a dot on themselves, demonstrating that they recognize the mirror image is themselves and not just another member of their species. The list of species that have passed this test is short enough that I can just go ahead and list them. Great apes, which are all apes except gibbons and including us humans. Two different species of dolphins, the bottlenose dolphin and orcas. The Eurasian magpie, which is the only non-mammal on this list. And a single Asian elephant, because when they tested other elephants, they all failed except for this one, which is kind of interesting. Previously, monkeys had failed this test, but this team is now reporting that rhesus monkeys can pass the test once they've been trained in how mirrors work. The team set up a game that could only be solved by understanding that a mirror was reflective, and after the monkeys figured that game out, they seemed to understand how mirrors worked and could pass the test. This is kind of a big deal. If the results hold in future studies, it might mean that the test can be given to many more species, provided we can teach those species the concept of reflection first. There may be many more self-aware animals out there than we thought, we just have to keep refining the test to accommodate them. I love this kind of science because it feels like we're extending our own brains, our own humanity into the animal kingdom and realizing more and more just how much the animal kingdom might be looking right back at us with more intelligence than we thought. So that's the news for today. Thanks for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you come across a story you'd like to hear about here, you could submit it to this station or tell me about it on Twitter at Haupt. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and this time we're introducing a new segment, BioBios. BioBios is the segment where I take a random species and tell you about it. And I really mean random. I'm using archive.org, that's A-R-K-I-V with a K as in arc, like a big boat, which is working to catalog, well... Basically all life on Earth. No big deal. They have a function on the website to pull up a random species, which is how I pick what I'm going to tell you about with a little additional research of my own, of course. Today's bio bio is for the Mexican blind cat, Priatella phreatophila. No, it isn't a cat, but it is from Mexico and it is blind. The Mexican blind cat is a species of cave fish, which lives underground in the waters of the state of Coahuila, Mexico. And uh, I am a gringo, so I apologize for the accent in advance which is in northern Mexico, just east of Chihuahua and south of Texas. Since we're talking about a Mexican fish, I'll tell you that its name in Spanish is Bagre de Musquiz. Bagre meaning catfish and Musquiz being a municipality within the state of Coahuila. So it literally means the catfish of Musquiz. And yes, it is within the group commonly called catfish, scientifically categorized as Order Siluriformes. It's a small fish, less than 10 centimeters or 4 inches, with a scaleless pinkish white body. Like many troglodyte or cave-dwelling species, the Mexican blind cat has indeed lost its eyes, but makes up for that loss with other sensory organs, including four pairs of long, whisker-looking barbels around its mouth because it is a type of catfish, after all. The fish also possesses a well-developed lateral line, which you might have heard about in sharks. It's a series of connected pores along the head and body that can be used to detect movements and vibrations in the surrounding water. As you might imagine, animals like these can be pretty difficult to study. From what we can tell, they eat things like mosquito larvae, which are also aquatic. Scientists have observed an aggressive behavior in males where they'll bite each other mouth to mouth, lock jaws, and just hold on for hours for no discernible reason. 
I mean, it's not like the females can see what they're doing and then be impressed. So if you have an idea what's going on there, let us know. Uh, life seems relatively chill for these fish as they don't seem to have any predators living in the caves with them, but they are listed as endangered by the ICUN Red List because the fish needs this underground freshwater habitats and the region of Mexico that it lives in has a really fast growing human population and humans also need to drink fresh water, which we pull from those underground resources using, you know, wells and stuff. So that's where these fish live and that's bad. Fortunately, it's possible that there are undiscovered or inaccessible underground waters that can serve as a refuge for these fish against extinction. It does make them that much more difficult to study, though. So that'll do it for this installment of BioBios. Thanks for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have your own species you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, you can submit it to this station or tell me about it on Twitter at Haupt. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and this time we're introducing a new segment, Q&A. In the Q&A segment, I, or maybe someone from the audience, hint, hint, will ask a seemingly simple question that I then answer with whatever complexity is required. The question this week, what is a theory? I felt compelled to use this as an inaugural question because it represents such a fundamental difference in the way scientists talk about the world versus the general public. Non-scientists refer to a theory as a good guess, a hunch, a speculation. That's what your one uncle means at Thanksgiving when he says, well, it's only a theory regarding, I don't know, gravity. Scientists use theory in a different way, and the difference here is significant. For scientists, a theory is defined as a plausible and accepted body of principles that can explain a given phenomenon. Now that's kind of a lot, so let's unpack it. What we mean here is that there are certain topics where research can be done on a variety of areas within that topic, and all that research builds into a consensus about how a thing works. That general consensus, or provisional, meaning it could be changed or overturned, understanding is collectively called the theory of X. The poster child for the just a theory insult, and yes, it is an insult, is probably evolution. For scientists, the theory of evolution is a collection of ideas representing our best explanation for how life on planet Earth became what it is and how it got to be that way. So biologists studying the mating calls of certain birds, ecologists studying how grasslands and forests interact, and paleontologists studying how fish became terrestrial tetrapods for the first time are all contributing to that body of knowledge that helps us understand evolution. And they're all relying on the same foundational principles of evolution to do it. Every time a study comes out regarding some part of evolutionary theory, the concept of evolution is being tested against the real world. So it's definitely not speculation. It's getting tested all the time. Because our understanding of the world is imperfect and incomplete, tweaks need to be made from time to time. How Newton understood and described gravity had to be updated when Einstein described how relativity was involved. And now we understand the universe a little better than we did before. It's a good thing. It's progress. And it's constantly being tested in ways that could prove it wrong. So now you hopefully have a better sense of what the two very different meanings of theory are, and you can put that one uncle in his place when he starts mouthing off. He can still disagree with our scientific understanding of gravity, but he shouldn't be saying we didn't even try to figure it out before putting it in the textbooks. So that's my Q&A rant. I'm really glad I got that off my chest. Thanks for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have your own cue that you would like aid, you can submit it to the station or tell me about it on Twitter at Haupt. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Hey, Organized Curiosity, this is Ian from The Politician. I'm calling in about your segment on theories. As a fellow scientist, I just want to point out one other criteria that makes a theory a theory that I think is super interesting and super important, and that is that the theory is falsifiable. And when I say falsifiable, I mean that the hypotheses that flow from a theory generate as many observable implications as possible, right? We want our theories to be as squishy as possible so that when it turns out that they can't be countered with evidence, that they show up stronger on our radar and we trust them for further theory building. Anyway, I just wanted to put in my two cents and remind everyone that the content of science is the method.
coming back at you to respond to what Ian had to say about my definition of theories and to talk a little bit about the philosophy of science. If you can hear wind in the background, that's because it is very, very windy today. If I just start screaming, that means that my building has been lifted off its foundations, I'm on my way to Oz, and I'll return as soon as I've exposed that wizard for the fraud he is. Anyways, Ian called in with a clarification about how scientific theories work. In my original segment, I hadn't mentioned anything about theories needing to be falsifiable. Put another way, for a theory to be valid, there has to be a way to disprove it. This aspect of science was first formalized by philosopher of science Karl Popper, one of the most influential philosophers of science of the 20th century. Popper focused on the demarcation problem, or how to offer a clear distinction between science and non-science, particularly pseudoscience, so things like homeopathy that claim to be scientific but aren't. And the idea he offered up was this notion of falsifiability as Ian described. Theories ought to provide predictions or hypotheses that can then be revealed as false so the theory can be rejected or modified to incorporate the new knowledge. The classic example of an unfalsifiable theory is the dragon in Carl Sagan's garage. The joke is Carl Sagan would claim to have a dragon in his garage. This could be falsified by opening his garage door and looking for a dragon. Obviously you wouldn't see a dragon and would therefore claim the dragon did not exist. To which Sagan would reply, well, it's invisible. So then you'd go get a pair of infrared goggles and look for the heat that the dragon must be emitting. Seeing nothing, you've again falsified the claim. But Sagan would say it's a perfectly thermally neutral dragon, so it emits no heat, so forth and so on. Every time you falsify the claim, he would introduce a new aspect of the dragon to prevent the falsification from happening. Science done properly tries its best to avoid this type of special pleading and accepts negative results as valid. If you want to read more about this thought experiment, he describes it in detail in his book, A Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. Falsifiability was also meant to tackle the problem of induction, which is the opposite of deduction or what Sherlock Holmes does. Inductive reasoning is taking a bit of data or logic and drawing it out beyond itself to reach a larger conclusion. Here's an example of an inductive argument that my high school physics teacher loved. All swans I've seen are white, therefore all swans must be white. Uh, this example is also where the notion of a black swan being a statistical anomaly comes from. In a way, this is how science can be done. All biological life observed so far requires liquid water to exist. Therefore, liquid water must be a necessary component for life. Why is this a problem? There are several flaws, but the one that's always stuck out to me is the one philosopher David Hume pointed out. The way that we think induction works is because of induction. In other words, induction has always worked so far, so it probably works. This is circular reasoning, and that's not good. Relying on falsifiability instead of induction helps us delineate science from non-science and doesn't require inductive reasoning. So problem solved, right? Not so fast. Philosophy, much like science, makes progress in its search for truth. So the reality is not nearly as simple as saying, if it can't be falsified, it can't be science, because these situations are always more complicated. Some have argued that Popper's take is a bit too blunt, and that science is a much fuzzier concept that can't be defined with the ease with which we would define something like a triangle. And some types of science defy easy falsification, the flagship being string theory, which is hugely debated within theoretical physics right now. But there's also aspects of other sciences, things like paleontology. How could you falsify the claim that T. rex occasionally ate triceratops? Even if you found bite marks on the bones of a Triceratops that match the T-Rex, it could have been chewing on it for a different reason other than trying to eat it. There could also be another species of dinosaur that we haven't discovered yet that has very, very similar teeth to T-Rex. And you can imagine a lot more permutations of these same kinds of arguments. So does this make the study of the dietary habits of theropod dinosaurs not science? It's a tricky problem, and it is one worth quibbling about amongst ourselves. Falsifiability works when it comes to saying things like homeopathy aren't science but I think it isn't always the best tool for the job within the nitty gritty world of actual science. That's probably more of a response than you were expecting, Ian, so feel free to keep submitting, and I'm sure between the two of us we can work this out and solve science once and for all. Before I go, I want to point out that most of my education on the philosophy of science came from Massimo Pigliucci, who started his career as a scientist and then switched over to being a philosopher of science, so he kind of understands both sides of the coin. He's written extensively on this subject. In particular, check out his book, Nonsense on Stilts, for a much longer and thought-provoking discussion of these sorts of topics. If you have questions about something you've heard here or just want to continue the discussion, please feel free to submit to my station. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Whoa. 
Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything in the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for the segment BioBios. BioBios is the segment where I take a random species and then tell you about it. And I really mean random. I'm using archive.org, that's archive with a K as in arc like a big boat, which is working to catalog, well, basically all life on Earth. No big deal. They have a function on the website to pull up a random species, which is how I pick what I'm about to tell you about, with a little additional research of my own, of course. Today's bio bio is for the Indian vulture, Gyps indicus. There are two types of vultures in the world. Old world vultures, found in Europe, Asia, and Africa, all contained within the family Acipitridae, and new world vultures, also known as condors of the family Cathartidae. The two groups are not that closely related, but are instead the product of convergent evolution, meaning the similarities between the two groups came about because they fulfilled a similar niche or role in the ecosystem. There are lots of examples of this type of evolution in nature. Think of the painful spines of porcupines and hedgehogs. Both evolved for a similar function, but completely independently of any genetic relationship between the two animals. Now, vultures and scavengers in general tend to get a bad rap because they're so closely associated with death. But think of it another way. Without these carrion, which is just a word that means dead flesh feeders, we'd live in a world where decomposition would be left to fungi and microbes and would take a lot longer. So I, for one, appreciate the service provided by these animals that are willing to clean up the environment for us by eating what's already dead. I'm not a birder, so my description here might not be up to snuff, but here goes. The Indian vulture is described as robust and scruffy, with a pale yellow bill and a sturdy, bald, black-skinned neck and head as an adult, but the juveniles have a white down on their head and neck that I think looks pretty cute. The wing feathers kind of fade from this creamy brown at the shoulder to dark brown flight feathers. To me, it looks like the difference between a black cup of coffee and one that has a little bit of milk in it. Their wingspan is between 6.4 and 7.8 feet, and they weigh about 12 to 14 pounds. All in all, it looks like a vulture. For organisms that make noise, I'll do my best to track down that noise, since this is an audio format. So here's what the Indian vulture sounds like, specifically what 10 of them sound like feeding on a carcass and then getting aggressive with each other and other birds to intimidate them away from their food. The Indian vulture is found in southeast Pakistan and peninsular India, which is the southern part of the subcontinent. They will form flocks not just with their own species, but also with the white romped vulture, Gyps benegalensis, during feeding. They like to make their nests on cliffs, but will occasionally use trees too. Their nest can be two to three feet across, so like big enough for a human to sit in. Females lay one egg per season between mid-November and early March, and both parents help incubate the egg for 50 days until it hatches. After hatching, both parents continue to defend the chick and help feed it. The Indian vulture will live in cities, towns, and villages, but also out in the wild. The obvious benefit of living near humans is access to things like garbage, which could have edible food waste, and slaughterhouses, which are an obvious treasure trove. Hopefully I've made a compelling argument as to why it's nice to have vultures around, so here's the bad news. This species is critically endangered, which is the status between just regular endangered and being completely extinct in the wild. Estimates suggest they've had at least a 95% population decline since the late 1990s. Imagine if 95% of something like house cats had died in the last 20 years. At first, it was thought that some virus was ravaging their populations, but additional tests showed that they were actually suffering from kidney failure caused by eating meat from cattle that had been treated during life with diclofenac, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. The amount of drug left in the cattle meat was enough for the vultures to OD on. Even if the drug was only present in a small proportion of the cattle herd, it was still enough to have this really enormous impact on the Indian vulture population. And guess what's happening now? Rotting carcasses are just sitting there being gross, potentially getting people sick, and leading to the rise of feral dog packs, which could transmit rabies. Rabies, as you probably know, can infect and kill humans, but is only transmitted between mammals, not birds like vultures. So in this instance, it'd be better to have vultures eating carcasses, not dogs. Diclofenac was banned in 2006 by the Indian government in favor of the vulture-safe drug Meloxicam, but enforcement hasn't been entirely successful. Since this drug is still being used where these vultures live, the current plan is to take as many of these vultures into captivity for 20 to 30 years and hope that we can help them recover for when their environment is safe for them to return to. If you want to learn more about efforts to conserve Asia's vultures, you can go to www.vulturerescue.org. Thanks for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have your own species you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, you can submit it to this station or tell me about it on Twitter at Haupt. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Whoa.
Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for news you probably cannot use. New science is coming out every day. Is it directly applicable to your life? Well, probably not. Is it still interesting? Probably yes. It's rare in this segment that I'll get to talk about something that you may have already seen in the actual news, but how could I resist talking about all these new exoplanets NASA just announced? Here are the basics. A joint team of astronomers from NASA and the European Southern Observatory using NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope have found the first known system with seven Earth-sized terrestrial exoplanets orbiting a single star named TRAPPIST-1. Three of these planets are in what we call the habitable or Goldilocks zone. Let's unpack what this means a bit. Exoplanets are any planet found outside our solar system. Terrestrial means they're made of rock, not gas. Stars are named, in part, based on what telescope telescope first observed them. This star was first observed in 1999 in the constellation Aquarius, but in 2015, a different telescope observed three planets around the star. That telescope was called the Transiting Planets and Planetesimals Small Telescope, acronym TRAPPIST, located at the La Silla Observatory in Chile. The telescope is operated by a Belgian team, so the acronym is also a reference to that nation's famous beer made by TRAPPIST monks. Since this was the first star that telescope had found with planets around it, they appended the number one. The planets are named alphabetically starting with B, so the first three planets were B, C, and D, starting closest to the star and working their way outward. The new planets discovered by Spitzer are designated E through H, maintaining that same inward to outward order. So that's some background. Now on to why this is a big deal. This marks a new record for the greatest number of habitable zone planets found around a single star outside our own solar system. The habitable zone is a range of distances from a star where it's possible that the planet could contain liquid water. Liquid water is considered an essential ingredient for the evolution of life. If the planet is too close to its star, the water boils off into vapor. If the planet is too far, the water is always frozen. So within the habitable zone, the temperature, just like Goldilocks's stolen porridge, is just right. TRAPPIST-1 is an ultra-cool dwarf star, so colder and smaller than our own sun, which does affect where that habitable zone is going to fall. The star is 39.5 light years away from us, meaning it takes a photon traveling at the speed of light 3 times 10 to the 8, that's 3 with 8 zeros behind it, meters per second through vacuum to get from there to here. I can't help but point out that this is roughly equal to 12 parsecs for all you Star Wars nerds out there wondering about the Kessel Run. There are actually a number of different methods for detecting exoplanets, and we don't have time to get into all of them, so we'll just focus on the method that both Trappist and Spitzer use to find these planets, transit photometry. Don't worry, it's actually pretty straightforward. Stars give off light at a pretty steady pace. If a planet orbiting that star passes between the star and a telescope observing that star, the telescope will observe a slight dip in the light from that star. While this method has disadvantages, one advantage is that using the amount of dip in light and the speed of the transit, so the speed at which the planet moves across the star, we can determine the mass and density of the planet, which is how we know that these seven planets are made of rock, not gas, and roughly the same size as Earth. Once Spitzer had spotted the additional planets, we turned Hubble on them to look at their atmospheres, which can be determined by the way the light from the star passes through the atmosphere of the planet, which helped confirm that they're made of rock. In addition to Spitzer and Hubble, scientists are now using the planet-hunting Kepler Space Telescope to make additional observations of this system in anticipation of the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope launching in 2018, which is going to be the best planet-finding tool we have ever had and should be able to detect the specific chemical ingredient of the atmospheres, the temperatures, and the atmospheric pressures of the planets within the habitable zone. Okay, that's a lot of info for what seems like a straightforward story, so let me sum up. About 40 light years from home, there is a star with at least seven rocky planets orbiting it, three of which are within the habitable zone where they might contain liquid water, ticking the boxes for at least two criteria we look for when looking for exoplanets that could contain life. So that'll do for this installment of news you probably cannot use. Thanks for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have your own news story you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, please submit it to this station or tell me about it on Twitter at Haupt. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn.
welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for the segment, Better Know a Root. I find that folks are often intimidated by the complicated jargon we scientists tend to use, but most of the time knowing what those words mean is just a matter of knowing what each part or root of the word means. So in Better Know a Root, we take a root word, define it, and give you some handy examples so you can use it yourself with confidence. Today's root is osteo, which is Greek for bone, typically used as a prefix. I guess that the English word featuring osteo that most folks are familiar with is osteoarthritis, which is a form of arthritis caused by the degeneration of cartilage in between bones, causing friction, inflammation, and pain. You may have also heard of osteoporosis, which is when bones become porous or full of holes, making them especially subject to fractures and breakages. Osteosclerosis is a condition of increased bone density, which can be used in the sense of a medical condition or also as an evolutionary trend in certain animals, especially those evolved for shallow diving, like manatees. An osteoderm is literally a bone embedded in an animal's skin, sometimes called scutes. So think like the skin of a crocodile or an armadillo shell or some of the armored dinosaurs like the Ankylosaurus or the Stegosaurians. At this point, you might be wondering about the time you broke a bone and went to see an orthopedist, not an osteologist. Osteology is the study of bones, whereas the medical profession of orthopedics is so named from ortho, which means straight or proper, and pedia, which means to train or bring up, both also from the Greek. So orthopedics is the practice of training broken bones to be straight again, rather than the specific study or treatment of the bones themselves. Obviously, medical professions evolve over time, but the nomenclature persists even if the original practice shifts away from simply setting broken bones and putting them in a cast. Now, hopefully, whenever you hear the term osteo, you'll know what's up. So that'll do for this installment of Better Know a Root. Thank you for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have your own route that you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, you can submit it to this station or tell me about it on Twitter at Halped. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the Anchor FM science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Halpton. It's time for the segment BioBios. BioBios is the segment where I take a random species and then tell you about it. And I really mean random. I'm using archive.org. That's archive with a K as an arc, like a big boat, which is working to catalog, well, basically all life on Earth. No big deal. They have a function on the website to pull up a random species, which is how I pick what I'm about to tell you about with a little additional research of my own, of course. And in this case, it's it's more than a little additional. <laughs> Today's BioBios is for the pygmy devil ray, the common name for at least two species of fish. So to be precise, we're talking about, and I apologize for my pronunciation ahead of time, Mabulu irigundu, oh God. Mabulu irigundu tinki also known as the longhorned mobula. The genus mobula is within the family Myliobatididae, known commonly as eagle rays, so named because this group of fishes will commonly breach or launch out of the water in a truly spectacular fashion. This is the same family to which the much larger manta rays belong. These fish are elasmobranchs, the group containing rays, sharks, skates, and sawfish, within the even larger group chondrichthys, which refers to those fish which have a skeleton made of cartilage, like the tip of your nose, instead of a skeleton made of bone, like the rest of your bones. I usually like to figure out what a genus and species name mean, especially when they're such a mouthful, like you heard me struggle with a second ago. So I did a little digging and found out that this particular critter was first described in 1859 by Pieter Bleeker, a Dutch medical officer working for the Royal Netherlands East Indies Army, famous for his descriptions and cataloging of fishes in the Dutch East Indies. The original description for this fish was the manuscript Conspectus Systematic Cipronium, published in the Natuurkundig Tijdschrift voor Nederlands Indie.
or the Physical Journal of Netherlands India. But the article was written in Latin, so as a non-speaker of Dutch nor Latin, that was sort of the point where I stopped trying. If you're up for it, you can find a scanned copy of the manuscript online at the Biodiversity Heritage Library, biodiversitylibrary.org. The pygmy devil ray looks like a smaller version of a manta ray. It's brownish gray on top, white underneath, and has the classic diamond-shaped dual wing-like disc for swimming with a thin spineless tail off the back, and the face with the two forward-facing lobes to help it feed. The max width of the wings is about one meter. We don't know much about this species, so here's a few things we do know. The pygmy devil ray feeds off of plankton and small fish which the lobes on its face help funnel into its mouth. They mate in shallow water where the female gives birth to just one offspring. And yes, I said give birth, not lay an egg. This is a form of reproduction known as ovoviparity. The embryo develops inside an egg, inside the mother. The offspring hatches from the egg while still inside the mother and then continues to feed off the yolk sac until ready to emerge alive from the mother. The pygmy devil ray is found near the surface in tropical coastal waters of the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans, ranging from South Africa north up to the Red Sea and eastwards to Vietnam, New Guinea, and Northern Australia. According to the ICUN Red List, the pygmy devil ray is classified as near threatened, so it's not hurting, but not without problems. The main threat is fishing. The pygmy devil ray is only marketed as food in Thailand and other parts of Southeast Asia but is probably caught as bycatch elsewhere in its range. Bycatch is the term in the fishing industry for the part of the catch not made up of the target species. So a fish that was caught that they weren't even trying to catch on purpose. While the lack of it being a target for food will hopefully reduce the overall impact on this species, remember that the female only produces one offspring at a time, meaning that each female will need to produce at least twice twice before being caught or otherwise killed to maintain, at the very least, a stable population. So that'll do for this installment of BioBios. Thank you for listening to my station. I really appreciate any applause or echoes. And if you have your own species you're excited about or question about something you've heard here, you can submit it to the station or tell me about it on Twitter at Haupt. Until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for the segment, News You Probably Cannot Use. Have you ever wondered what the deepest point in the ocean sounds like? Yeah, me neither. It seems like most of the time we're presented with the deep ocean, it's this soundless void accompanied by an occasional bioluminescent critter. As with most things, especially on this show, you'll find that the reality is a bit more complicated. Odds are you're listening to me via sound waves, unless there's some cool future technology that makes this broadcast telepathic. Sound travels in waves through matter, distinct from light, which can travel just fine through a vacuum. This difference is significant because the matter through which sound travels has an effect on how far and how powerfully it can travel. You may have heard that sound travels better underwater than through air. The reason for that, in part, because again, it's complicated, is that water is more dense than air. Long story short, the denser the matter, the easier it is for sound to travel through it. So you might think the deep ocean is this very isolated place, and it is, but sound travels better down there, so it's a surprisingly noisy place. Just how noisy? Well, that's where the news part of this segment comes in. Researchers from NOAA, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, dropped a microphone into the Challenger Deep Trough of the Marianas Trench, aka the deepest spot in the ocean. Studying noise in the ocean is important because lots of organisms, including things like charismatic whales, rely on sound to communicate under the waves. So the research team wanted to know if human noise might be making an impact underwater. A lot of science requires the establishment of baselines. So even though humans have been making oceanic noise for a while now, it helps to measure noise now and see how it changes in the coming years. I'm no engineer, but building a microphone that can survive functionally at pressures more than 1,000 times our normal atmosphere is a big deal. So there's a technological achievement to be recognized in addition to the scientific knowledge gained. Listening to recordings from the trench, the team found that they could easily hear whale songs, nearby earthquakes, and passing ships. So let's have a listen. Here's what a ship's propeller sounds like.
Here's the song of a baleen whale, maybe a bride's whale. Compare that to the echolocation sounds from a toothed whale. And finally, a magnitude 5.0 earthquake off the coast of Guam. Now that these microphones are available, we can repeat these measurements again and again to look for changes in deep ocean noise that might negatively affect wildlife of those regions. Fingers crossed our impact is minimal, but the only way we can know for sure is by taking careful measurements over time and testing those measurements against our expectations and looking for effects, positive or negative. It may seem basic, but sometimes science is just testing our most obvious assumptions against what actually happens in reality. So that'll do for this installment of news you probably cannot use. If you have your own science story you're excited about or questions about something you've heard here, let me know. And until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. I'm your host, Ryan Haupt, and it's time for the segment BioBios. Today's BioBio is for the Gemsbach, Oryx gazella, also known just as an Oryx. That's right, we've gone into African antelope territory, a treasure trove of hooves and horns. The Gemsbach is found in southwest Africa, including Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. They live in semi-arid to arid grasslands and bushlands, but also light woodlands. Arid is just a sciencey word for dry. Now, I know I suffer from some mammalian favoritism here, but this thing is gorgeous. Gemsbachs are big, robust, and have these really striking black and white faces and long, straight, rapier-shaped horns possessed by both sexes. The female's horns are actually longer. The horns were even sold as unicorn horns in medieval England. The rest of the body is fawn gray with some additional black and white coloration on its underbelly and legs, and their tail looks a lot like a horse's. Because they are specialized for arid environments, the Gemsbach can survive without drinking water for most of the year. They can serve water by spending the day in the shade and only being active during the early morning, late afternoon, or night. Instead of panting or sweating to cool down, the Gemsbach just lets its body temperature rise when it gets hot, which is dangerous for other reasons, but does help conserve that precious, precious moisture. Gemsbachs are gregarious or social animals, forming herds of up to 30 individuals led by a dominant male teaming up with other herds to form groups of several hundred when they move to fresh grazing grounds. So here's a weird linguistic quirk you may not have known. Grazing in ecology refers specifically to eating grass, whereas browsing refers to eating leaves from shrubs, herbs, bushes, and trees. When grass isn't available, Gemsbox will browse, and during droughts they'll dig up tubers, so think like potatoes, with their hooves to get some moisture and food. Male Gemsbox establish a territory once they mature at age 5 or 6. Territories average around 25 square kilometers, which is pretty big. Females within the territory only mate with the dominant male and give birth to a single calf after a pregnancy of around 264 days. Calves stay hidden during the day because lions and junk, but will come out at night to hang with mom or move to a new feeding site. After three to six weeks, the calf joins the herd where it will live for up to 20 years. Unsurprisingly, Gemsbox have suffered from range declines due to human expansions, especially those humans with livestock in need of territory to graze, but so far it is still listed as least concerned by the ICUN red list. Because it has these really awesome horns in both sexes, trophy hunting happens. One of the ironies of African trophy hunting is because people are willing to pay a lot of money for the opportunity to shoot one of these animals until they're dead so they can cut its head off. Is that that too much? Sorry, that's literally what the sport is. Means that the African nations within which it occurs are incentivized to make sure they have plenty of gems box available so a few can be hunted without hurting the overall population. So, like... So that's good. I'll end by encouraging you to go look up some pictures of these guys. I'll admit that there are so many ungulates in Africa that it can be easy to get overwhelmed, but the Gemsbach is worth your time, so go check it out. And that'll do for this installment of BioBios. Thanks for listening to my station. If you have your own species you're excited about or a question about something you've heard here, you can let me know. And until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn.
Present day Ryan popping back in here because I got a question called in related to the Gemsbach segment you just heard. In particular, how do the Gemsbach know to go looking for things like tuber when they need extra moisture in their diet? And then how do animals in general kind of know the stuff about taking care of themselves that you or I might suffer at if we were dropped in the forest and expected to survive? So I kind of try to summarize the question in the next segment when I answer it, but I wanted to let you all know that you didn't miss anything because I just didn't have the audio. Okay, back to it. Welcome to Organized Curiosity, the anchor science station dedicated to cataloging everything we know about the natural world for your edutainment. So Maya called in with a few related but all fairly complex questions. In summary, are animals more in tune with themselves and their environment? How conscious are animals of this stuff? And do they listen to their bodies better? Just what is going on? As you can probably already tell from the sound of my voice, I'm not an ethologist, which is a scientist that studies animal behavior, but I study other aspects of animals, so I'm gonna take a swing at answering these as best I can. My take on why animals seem to know how to take care of themselves better than humans is a couple of reasons. First and foremost, because they have to. Most modern first world humans lead incredibly cushy lives. We've never truly known hunger, never truly known thirst, never truly been on the verge of freezing to death or deficient of basic vitamins and nutrients. We are captivated by stories of when humans push themselves to the absolute limit to survive, whereas for many animals, that's just another day in the life. Unless you live or have spent much time in sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia, you've probably never had another animal, in this case a big cat, look at you as its next potential meal. I'm getting a little hand wavy here, but I think that there's a reason the roar of a big cat is scary to the core of a human because some little part of your brain remembers when that was the sound associated with your impending death. You probably thought I was going to put in a lion roaring or something right now to freak you out, but I'm not going to do that. That's mean. So animals are better at that stuff because their entire lives are surviving just long enough to reproduce and contribute their genetics to the next generation. And without the distractions we humans have come up with for how to take our minds off of survival, you either through instinct or trial and error figure out how not to die. It's also important to remember that in the case of the Gemsbox, they're social. So it's possible that it only takes one clever Gemsbox to dig up the first tuber to get the rest of them trying the same thing. And if that behavior leads to increased fitness and survival, it'll persist in the population. That's literally how natural selection works. You probably have some behaviors that you do that are analogous to the sort of in-tune nature of animals. You just don't think about them in the same context. For example, when it's cold, we like to snuggle up under a blanket into kind of a ball shape, which is decreasing your surface area to volume ratio so you'll lose heat less quickly, particularly from your extremities. This is the same thing as an arctic fox curling up in the snow, so give yourself some credit. I distinctly remember the first time I was in the tropics understanding what the point of a siesta was. It gets so hot down there that expending energy and heating yourself up is dangerous and stupid. So you take a nap and wait for things to cool down. I was camping and I remember midday seeing a bunch of capuchin monkeys come over to the stream near where we had camped, grab a sip of water, and plop down for a nap, just like I was doing at the same time on the ground. We also crave things that are calorie rich, like fat and sugar, because we evolved in a world where those things were scarce. We just now happen to live in a world where those things are plentiful for people in the first world, so we have to fight against our animal urges rather than use them to survive. The second part of the question, how much do these animals think about what they're doing is tougher. The reason it's a tough question to articulate and answer is because it's genuinely tough to know what it is that animals know. As humans, we employ metacognition or thinking about thinking all the time. We're constantly self-reflecting and monitoring our own thoughts and memories, and because we've developed language, we can easily communicate with each other about our cognitive processes. To look for those same responses in animals is tougher because we can't simply ask. One way is to look at the size and complexity of an animal's brain, especially relative to its body size. This is called the encephalization quotient, and it also comes with expectations of how big a brain ought to be relative to its body size for given groups of animals like mammals, birds, reptiles, fish, etc. So if a brain is really heavy relative to the mass of the mammal in question, we presume greater intelligence because brains are greedy organs that take up a lot of energy to maintain, so you don't bother to evolve it unless you really need it. An encephalization quotient, or EQ, score of 1 would mean that the brain of an animal is exactly the size expected given the size of that animal and the type of animal that it is. Above 1 means more brain, and below 1 means less. Primates, cetaceans, and elephants all have high EQs, above 1 or even up in the 2s and 3s. Things like horses and sheep, which are probably good estimates for something like a Gemsbach, are 0.8 or 0.9. On the opposite end of the spectrum are behaviors that are purely instinctual and require no cognition or thought to accomplish. An example of these are something called Called fixed action patterns, behaviors that run start to finish based on stimulus and can't be interrupted. A common example of these are egg retrieval behavior in the gray lag goose. When birds nest on the ground, sometimes eggs can 
roll out of the nest. It is essential to the species' survival that those eggs be retrieved as quickly as possible. So a goose seeing an egg-shaped object away from the nest automatically goes into retrieval mode, rolling the egg back to the nest with its beak. We can tell this behavior is fixed and inalterable because, and I know this is going to sound mean, you can pick up the egg while the goose is rolling it and the goose will keep doing the rolling motion with its beak before restarting the process back where you set the egg down again. Now quit being a jerk and let the goose finish its job. So that's a lot of info, but animal behavior is really complicated and a super active area of continued research. I hope that this sort of gets at what you wanted to know, Maya, and thanks again for calling in. If you have your own cue you'd like, A, you can submit it, and until next time, stay curious out there. There's a lot to learn. So that was the audio I decided to use in this episode. I'm guessing it's about a third of everything I produced. The file folder structure I use doesn't make it easy to tally that up. So uh, I'll do these every once in a while, probably when we're running low on content for the week or haven't had a chance to record. I hope you enjoyed it. I would love any feedback you have for me. Um, you can contact the show at our website, scienceorb.com. You can contact me directly on my website, ryanhaupt.com, or on Twitter at Haupt. And with that, let's go ahead and do a quick paleo pow because you've certainly heard me talking enough and I would like to turn my air conditioning back on because it's hot. So for this episode, I'm going to thank Billy Nitro, who has called into the show before and has an excellent radio voice and has been just kind of a long time contributor to the show. In addition to calling in, he also gives a recurring donation on the now uh, somewhat defunct PayPal system. You can still give a one-time donation through PayPal, but he got in while there were still recurring donations available on PayPal. And uh, because this episode was kind of about me finding my radio voice, I wanted to acknowledge a guy who already had one who is also a supporter of the show. So Billy, thanks so much. It's always great to hear from you. And it's been really awesome to have you as a fan of the show, as well as everybody else who contributes to the show, especially our contributors on Patreon. So I know we've been doing a thing where we give out a fun thesis title to folks who give to us on Patreon at a certain level. I'm not going to do those on the episodes where it's just me because that's not as fun uh but we'll get back to that as soon as i'm recording with other people if you'd like to learn more about becoming a patron you can do so at patreon.com slash science sort of uh we are very close to our next goal which will be public hangouts in a google hangout session with all of our patrons so if that's something you'd be interested in doing with us uh you can go sign up there and we're really looking forward to doing that and so thanks to everyone who chooses to support us in that way obviously itunes reviews and just telling your friends about the show are all great ways to promote the word of science sort of as well you guys are our marketing division as my friends on ifanboy like to say but i'm saying it to you guys too so you know whatever you can do to help spread the word about science sort of we would really appreciate it and we'll be back next week next week won't be another one of these anchor style shows because i know that would get really tedious we do have stuff recorded i just wanted to drop this one in to give us a little bit of a buffer time for the week coming up. So tune in next time where you're bound to get a lot more science. Sort of. Visit sciencesortof.com for show notes, links to all the stories we talked about, and ways to interact with the hosts, guests, and other listeners. Science Sort of is brought to you by the Brachialobe Media Network of Podcasts with audio engineering by Tim Dobbs of the Encyclopedia Brunch Podcast. That's all for this week. See you next time on Science Sort of. saying sort of multiple times and stacking it to see if they sounded any different, but I was trying to be really consistent. Don't know if it worked. We'll find out when I start editing. Peace.